as you've heard about six times now, my name is Dania Azapati. Um, I'm a user experience designer and occasional content writer here in Melbourne. So today I'll be talking about the power of inclusive and exclusive language. Um, I won't be talking today about the kind of explicit examples where you're calling someone a name or actively using a discriminatory slur. I'll be focusing on the kind of more subtle ways of excluding people through language, um, sometimes unconscious or unintentional words that you're using, which can be much harder to identify and call out. So there is a content warning in this talk. I'll be using sexist and gendered language, um, homophobic and heteronormative language, and ableist language, which may be triggering or upsetting to some people. But these will be used as examples only for the purpose of the discussion. Um, I also want to stipulate that what I'm about to talk about is in no way an exhaustive list of types of exclusive language that we should avoid. But it is, however, a good starting point for discussion on this topic. And I also want to acknowledge my own privilege. Um, I'll be using examples that reference groups of which I'm not a part, and I want to just be clear that I'm not trying to represent them um, or speak to anyone's experiences other than my own. So, word power. When I was a kid, my sister and I didn't always get along that well. We're pretty good now, but she would say things that would hurt me, and she was older than me. I thought she had some kind of a position of authority, and I went to my dad and was like, what do I do when I'm upset? He tried to help by giving me his version of the old nursery rhyme, sticks and stones may break my bones, but your words will never hurt me. I tried really hard to take this on board, um, but it kind of felt like it didn't matter what I did, it was her words that were doing the hurting. In our society that supposedly legally restricts breaking people's bones, our words can be our most powerful everyday weapon. Words harm often whether we want them to or not. So what is inclusive language? To help define it, I'll be defining exclusive language. And I really wanted to get this right, so I googled it, and I borrowed a definition from the Flinders University Equal Opportunity Resources in which they explain discriminatory language. They say, many common English terms and expressions create and reinforce bias against individuals and groups of people. Often, this is done unconsciously. Even when used unconsciously, it could create an environment that is humiliating, offensive, and alienating in its effects. Language can also have the effect of creating and reinforcing negative stereotypes about particular groups of people by either exaggerating or isolating particular features of that group. So what this is saying is that our words hold the power to shape our society and uphold its norms, however discriminatory they may be. Inclusive language does just the opposite of this. It positively respects, reflects and upholds the diversity of our society and it avoids words and phrases that marginalise or exclude people or groups from feeling like they're part of a group. So why does this talk matter? Well, as I said before, exclusive language can be really difficult to identify and challenge and to replace with inclusive language. We learn a lot of things growing up that become completely normal to us. Slang words, cool terms, just things that we say. It can be hard to isolate the problematic nature of normalised language and then to know what else to say to someone who is using it. But we can learn how to do this. We're living in a digital age. We can talk and learn like I'm doing right now. And we have the privilege of being able to actually enact real change with our words. And this does matter to people. So during my teen years, one of the many phrases that I picked up to describe something that I didn't like was, that's gay. You had a lot of homework, that's gay. Couldn't go to a party, super gay. I don't know where I'd picked it up from, but I had, and so had all of my friends, and so had whoever was writing the scripts of the films and TV shows we were watching and the magazines that we were reading. Once I started at uni, I made a good friend who came out about a year after I met him. We were talking about his summer and something had gone wrong, I can't remember what. And I was like, yeah, that's gay. And he was kind of like, yeah. And as soon as I said it, I was like, maybe something's wrong. But the first time I made some connection between what I thought I was saying and what I was actually saying. So why did the term gay mean something bad? This was clearly a homophobic thing to say to someone. And I'd said it to so many people and I'd heard so many other people say it too. So I'd never really realised how bad it was because it was normal. I identified as heterosexual, so in the early 2000s, particularly at an all-girls Catholic school, I was seen as the norm. And it was quickly becoming apparent that all the language we used reinforced this. I certainly didn't consider myself to be homophobic, but I was beginning to realise that maybe the words that I was using were. 
and therefore they were harmful to others, whether I want them to be or not. It was a little hard to get my head around the situation because inclusive language can be difficult to connect with at times because it usually requires a little more thought than if you're just calling someone a name, which you're doing because you want to hurt them, so you know that it's bad. This situation required realising something that I didn't think was bad, was bad, and then trying to unlearn using that. So I hadn't directly called my friend a homophobic slur, but the words I used in passing to describe something that was bad were drawing directly upon his sexual orientation and using it to criticise. Hurting him was the last thing I would have wanted to do, but my intent was irrelevant here. It's only my impact that mattered. So this was a real eye-opener for me. Since then, I've become more and more aware of the words that we use that exclude. And I feel it's my responsibility, and now ours, that I'm talking with you to try and share this awareness. If you do a quick Google search on inclusive language, it will generate heaps of results. It's incredible how prevalent exclusive language is, which is what I'll be discussing next. So, some insanely dumb examples of crazy, stupid language. It's about the prevalence of ableism. This is so, so common in our media. We have seven insane tips for brightening up your room, dumb ways to die, crazy, stupid love. If you've ever used these words, they're ableist. It's language which reinforces discrimination against and preju prejudice towards people with disabilities. Words like crazy or insane reinforce the stigma held towards people with mental illness. Saying something is dumb or lame targets the experiences of people with physical disabilities. Words like moron, stupid, idiot have medical diagnostic roots, but they quickly became used to insult people's intellectual abilities. I've probably heard all of these words used around me in the last week multiple times, whether they're just thrown into casual conversation or they're in a headline that I've read. They always used to describe something that could easily be described with a non-ableist term. But often it's the ableist term which comes to mind first when we're trying to find a descriptor because it is so common. And this is damaging. So it has been difficult for me to try and cut ableist language out of my vocabulary because it is so, so common. If someone does something annoying to you, you want to say they're being a dumbass or an idiot. Now I try to say, you don't know what you're talking about or you're being annoying. It doesn't roll off the tongue quite as easily, but you know what? It's far easier for me to put a bit of effort into changing my language than it is for people to live their lives being systematically disadvantaged by a society that doesn't allow for diversity. The responsibility on me to try and educate myself isn't comparable to that feeling of being excluded. As I said earlier, and I'm gonna keep saying, I think we have a responsibility to share what we've learned and encourage other people to also be more inclusive in their language, like I'm doing now. So we need to call it out. Taking the time to consider the impact of words that you've learnt since childhood are okay can be a real challenge for a lot of people. Unlearning things doesn't come naturally to most of us. And it's not a priority for most people in their everyday lives. They're all busy with their life stuff. It's hard to properly try and see things from another perspective that you might not regularly engage with and to change your behaviour because of it. But we need to learn from one another's lived experiences. If you've got a loud voice like me, it's important to try and use it and use my privilege to make space for others who may not have the same. So when you're trying to call someone out and trying to encourage them to reconsider their language, particularly if it's something they've used a million times before, it can be met with resistance. Telling a colleague that telling you to man up is sexist doesn't usually go down too well. I think, I'm a nice person. I love women. My mother's a woman. She says man up all the time. <laughs> and so on. They might well be a nice person, but it's what they've said which is harmful. We know that telling someone that to be a man is to be tough and unemotional and strong spreads toxic, toxic masculinity. But telling adults, particularly in a workplace, that their language reinforces a system that actively harms people of all genders can be a little difficult to casually throw into conversation. I found that often the first response from people when you try to call, a, call them out is to be really defensive. They think that you've got a problem with them rather than what they're saying. It's important to try and be clear in explaining that it's the language which is the problem and not the person themselves. Let them know that we all say problematic things and we're all learning and we probably will still always be learning, which is actually a good thing. We don't have to be perfect, but we do have to be open to trying to change what we think is normal. 
I try to be clear that being called out can be reframed as an opportunity. It's an opportunity to become a better person, to try and make a more inclusive space for others. And it's an opportunity to take steps towards making your workplace a more inclusive environment with but a few simple changes to your vocabulary. If it's that changing up of words which becomes an issue for some people, I try to offer up alternatives. Why not say, toughen up? Or why not say, you can do it, and be encouraging rather than demanding? Whatever your alternative is, it's important to try and take away the part which focuses on someone's identity that differentiates them. In this example, it's a gendered aspect to take away so that you're not talking about women, you're just talking about people. If that all does fail, maybe tell them to woman up and get over it. <laughs> so maybe that doesn't always work, but flipping the term around can be a really good way to illustrate how things are actually kind of a ridiculous thing to say. There's a Twitter account that you may have heard of that does this really brilliantly. Um, it's called Man Who Has It All. I do want to call out that it does focus on gender as a binary, um, as to the examples I'm about to discuss. But this account is basically tweeting advice for working dads from the perspective that women have the power and privilege that men do today and that men are in a similar state to women now. And this is a great example, which is I'm not hung up on the label spokeswoman because I know it covers both women and men. Damien, male chairwoman. Very sensible. Another favourite of mine, which is I find really funny because I'm in the tech space, is I don't mind being called a girl at work because I know it covers men too. Richard, IT support, one of the girls. <laughs> <laughs> Whilst undeniably funny, there is a bit of flavour to these tweets. By turning the situation on its head, they poignantly illustrate just how omnipresent this gendered language is, which typically excludes anyone who doesn't identify as a man from professional spheres. That said, there is a power in humour, and it can be a gentle way of identifying a problem with some language, rather than making someone think that you're having a problem with them. I'll wrap up with sort of a case study. It's a little bit of a contentious example, um, but it is great for illustrating these techniques for calling out exclusive language, which is, of course, the ever popular, hi guys. I personally don't find hi guys to be a gender neutral term, although some people do, and that's okay for them. Um, and I work in tech, so there are a lot of men around. And just this fact alone, that there are way more men than women, makes me feel a lot like I don't belong. So when someone says, I'll just get the guys to look at it, and the guys in this context is refer referencing a group of people of which I'm a part, it's another reminder that I don't belong. Or if someone says, the guys and I took a client to the golf meeting, and when the guys are an almost entirely man group of partners that run a business, um, it reminds me that there's no one in a senior position like me, and it makes, me harder for me, it makes it harder for me to imagine being in that position. And this has impact on my career, and I don't want that because it's already kind of hard enough being a woman of colour trying to have a successful career in tech. So, how can you respond? First up, offer alternatives. My favourite alternatives to hi guys are hi peeps, hello folks, hello friends, hi everyone. I will often ask people politely not to refer to me as a guy and suggest some other things for them to say. And I just try to say these myself all the time, and I have noticed that other people have started picking them up as well. Option two is to flip it. Say, I'll just get the girls to look at it. Referring to your average group of developers as the girls will probably generate some confusion at work. <laughs> a third technique that I haven't gone into just yet because it's kind of a last resort is to just not respond. If asking politely, providing alternatives, and then flipping it in a humorous way doesn't work, maybe just stop responding. Really, if they're not using a term that's including you, then they're the ones who are being exclusive. So it's not really on you to try and include yourself in a group that they're not doing the work for. If you don't identify as a man, they're not addressing you. Hopefully they'll understand by then if you just stop answering. Maybe they'll ask why, maybe you can tell them then. So I've given you a few ways to call out other people, but what if someone calls you out? Remember, this is okay. Um, try to apply what I just talked about to yourself. You don't have to be perfect, just open to trying to understand a different perspective to your own. Listen to someone, else's who, someone else whose lived experiences might not be the same as yours, and who may be affected differently by what you say. Understand that they may be angry and hurt. 
Don't try to avoid it by saying, oh, it was just a joke, because that shirks the responsibility of what you've said. Don't say, I'm sorry if I offended you, because if they've called you out, you have offended them. Apologize and try to learn. Try to understand that you've had a negative impact and why you've had that negative impact so you can avoid doing it again in the future. And then share what you've learned with others. Use the power of your words to make yourself and others more inclusive, just like I've had the opportunity to do so today. I'll wrap up with what hopefully is the key thing I've managed to communicate today, which is your words have power. Use them for inclusion. And I just want to say a special thanks to my friend Mel for doing these slides for me. That's her Instagram handle. She's an amazing illustrator. And thank you all. Thank you so much. That was awesome. What is the kind of reaction you get in public, other than I'd imagine this is quite a safe space in public, like on Twitter, et cetera, when you talk about this? Um, I don't actually tweet a lot. Um, I mostly actually just retweet stuff from Man Who Has It All. <laughs> um, but, it, I mean, it can be mixed. It, I hate to say it, but the approach that you take to calling someone out does matter, and it shouldn't, because if people are problematic, you shouldn't be told to temper your anger or your emotions in order to argue in a more rational way. But um, I've found that by trying to sort of stay calm and use the techniques that I talked about in the workplace and stuff. Some people can really get on board with it. Um, I think that whilst people are becoming more aware of inclusiveness and then other people are kind of going far, far in the opposite direction, those people who are kind of already becoming aware of the society and the diversity that we have here um, are more open to this kind of thing. Like someone said, hi guys, I think last week, and I was like, please don't call me that. And they're like, oh, sorry, uh, hello. Everyone, I was like, better. <laughs> so I think that um, like I'm quite happy to talk about it because I believe in it so firmly and I think it's such an easy thing for us to do, just change the words you say and it can have such powerful impact. So I'm quite happy to argue until the cows come home about this with people if I have to, but I have found that I haven't actually usually had to that much because it can be quite easy to illustrate just how wrong some things people say are, even though they're very used to it. Hi guys is the one that I usually have the most trouble with. Because every time you say, I care about this term, there's about there's a bunch of other people who say, I don't mind if you say that. And I'm like, one person doesn't represent a group kind of thing, you know, the usual stuff. That's loud. Uh, hey, hi. Um, I didn't have a question so much as like an additional note, I guess. Um, you may already know this, but didn't go into time, but I think it's important. But uh, with ableist terms like um, idiot, moron, imbecile, and so on, they not only have origins in like medical terms, but also origins in medical terms that were tied to eugenics and around like, oh yeah, you know, the, the imbecile should not be allowed to reproduce and so on. Um, that's like, yeah, especially important, I think, because a lot of people don't know that. Anyway, sorry. Um, yeah. I'm curious um, if you've encountered this particular situation, what you tend to do about it. Um, in terms of the guys thing, especially, um, sort of when you offer people alternatives or people try and come up with their own alternatives and they sort of miss the mark, um, one thing I find particularly frustrating is being referred to as a lady. <laughs> I, I identify more as a guy than a lady, so if you're going to do one or the other. Um, but I, I start to feel like you're just you know, you're creating this, like, seemingly endless, like, list of things. And someone, you know, when someone's trying, you're constantly coming back to them and going, like, no, that's not good enough. You know, you need to, you need to do it differently. Um, yeah, how do, you, how do you deal with that? Um, yeah, I agree with what you're saying because I sometimes feel bad because when there are people I know who are, more willing to kind of get on board with diversity and inclusion, um, I actually find that I'm more likely to keep calling them out because they say things and they've learned something great, like, well done, cool. Um, and then there are more problematic things that they say because there are problematic things that all of us say. And it can feel sometimes like there is just too many things to call out, but I mean, I'm sure people felt that way about other things that are 
that are now just completely socially normal now, which weren't previously, and you just have to keep trying. And I also personally hate ladies. Um, and when it's kind of when other people who you've called out for high guys, when they try and flip it, you're like, no, 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 no. <laughs> You don't understand just yet. Um, I think you just have to be persistent with it. And um, yeah, I, it's always good to have a few examples up your sleeve that you can just hand out when the time comes. Yeah, I'm not sure if that was super helpful, but I think you just have to keep trying. Uh, following on from that, I've had interactions where I've had people go, oh, you know, that's insane. And I've got, no, that's kind of ableist, use a different word. And they've corrected themselves and said, oh, sorry. What I meant to say is, oh, that's crazy. And, I <laughs> <laughs> and like, how do you deal with that where they use three or four terms and you keep having to go, uh, maybe not? Yeah, um, I guess again, just try to have some examples up your sleeve. I've started saying stuff like, that is wild. And I sound a bit strange when I do it, but um, it's it's become like the normal thing for me to say instead of ableist terms. Um, ableism is a really hard one because it is just everywhere. Like I swear, every single article I read, but even from publications that try and be like socially aware, like that they, they just don't quite get it. It's like people sort of engage to a certain point and then think they're engaged, and then are no longer sort of willing to go further. But um. Yeah, I think just try to have some alternatives up your sleeve that you can that you can give them, and if you can go into the factual stuff, the history stuff, if you've got time, like people shouldn't have to, but they seem to take sciencey fact stuff on board way more than just my emotional response to what they're saying. Yeah. We're going to wrap it up there. We well, can grab you can grab Dania at lunch though. Okay, can we have a massive round of applause for Dania? Thanks. <laughs>